Welcome to Women With Drive, a podcast from the Deakin Melbourne Boomers, talking all things women's hoops, hosted by Boomer's own Lou Brown. Hi everyone listening or maybe watching, I'm so thrilled to be able to welcome you to Women With Drive, a podcast brought to you by the Deakin Melbourne Boomers. Was a little nervous with this next guest, but more so super excited to be able to speak with Lauren Jackson herself. Women with Drive. I can't exactly put into words how excited I am right now that I'm having the opportunity to interview an absolute idol of mine from the day I picked up a basketball. As with many young Australians who have ever picked up a basketball, Lauren Jackson is someone who we look up to on and off the court. So thank you so much, Lauren, to, Lauren for giving us your time today on Women With Drys. Absolutely honoured to have you here. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm sort of, you know, obviously I've got some ties with the boomers and it's really cool just to, you know, be on your program. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, many of us, we, we know your lengthy list of career highlights and I could list them and all, but we'd take up all of the podcasts and maybe a couple more. <laughs> so today, you know, we're just, we're speaking the Olympics specific, specifically. So as uh, an Australian Opal, WNBA and WNBL legend, uh, we'll just quickly recap the Olympics specifically. Uh, four-time Olympian, Sydney 2000, Athens 2004, Beijing 2008, and then of course London 2012 where you had the honour of being the flag bearer for the entire of the Australian Olympic team. Four-time medalist, three silvers, one bronze, and I absolutely just have to highlight the gold medal at the 2006 World Championships. And now post playing, uh, you are heading up the women's basketball at Basketball Australia. So Lauren, once again, welcome to Women With Drive. Um, Thank you. But, so simple question to start, three word, what three words come to mind to describe the experience of being a part of the Opals and as an Olympian? Uh, three words, uh, I would say pride. Um, I'd say honor for sure. and. I'd say perseverance. I think, you know, those three words sort of, I guess, encapsulate it for me. It's the national team was uh, just playing for it was the greatest honour, you know, that any athlete could have. And um, putting on the green and gold strip, whether it was a bodysuit or just a regular uniform, was just so special to me. And I, you know, I really tried to make sure that I was there, particularly at the major events, um, because there's nothing like representing your country and then, you know, also having that platform. No, absolutely. And, and I'm absolutely know now that those are still things you embody even uh, post career, post, post basketball career as well. Um, now, the Opals, they have a bit of an experience of uh, a mix of experience and youth. You have Ezzy Magbagor, a, a 21 year old, going into her first Olympics, and then Leilani Mitchell as a 36 year old. Uh, Lauren, you were 19 years old in Sydney and 31 years old in London. How are these experiences different at different stages of your career as an athlete? I think my first Olympics, I definitely was very naive as to what, you know, what I would be experiencing um, and the pressure. And I, I really just went in um, with no expectation whatsoever. And I just went in and had fun, you know, and I played great basketball. It was, um, I was just doing what I love doing. Um, and I was also in an environment where I felt really safe as well. Like the girls on that team were just incredible and they treated me like big sisters. They always had me um, under their wing and, and then also to the coach and um, Marion Stewart, our manager, um, they'd sort of, I guess, tried to keep me um, out of the limelight a little bit. They'd made sure that I wasn't doing press conferences and things like that so that the pressure didn't sort of mount up. So, and I didn't know that at all. Um, they did a really good job yeah. of sort of keeping me separate from all of it. Um, so I really just went in and played and thoroughly enjoyed it. I was at home. Um, you know, my, my grandparents live in Bankstown uh, in Sydney, so... Homebush was just right around the corner. And um, I, yeah, I had just some great experiences. Um, as opposed to my last one, you know, that was awesome too. I had a great time in London. Obviously, I was a flag bearer, but my body was starting to break down a little bit. Um, and I was in a completely different role. I was someone who was uh, sort of leading and, and trying to be a bit of a role model for the younger players coming in. Um, no, I mean, and I think as well, like 
your first Olympics and then you're at home in Sydney, I think you said it, it's just would ease a couple of those nerves going in. But what a, what a surreal experience to have to have with you and your family for, for the rest of your lives. Um, yeah. Could you maybe give us a little of an idea of what the day in the life of an Olympian looks like in the village kind of during pool games and, and then into the medal round? So a day in the life of village, in the life of an athlete in the village. Um, gosh, I can't even remember. That's going back <laughs> a lot of now. Um, look, all I now. remember is <laughs> food hall, you know, like the village is massive. So you've got transport um, in there that can take you through all the different um, countries, areas. And, you know, you've got a massive big food hall. So breakfast, lunch, dinner, you can go in there and get free McDonald's all day long, any McDonald's that you wanted. Like it was always there. Wow, so that's yeah. all I can really remember. <laughs> I know. Um, but no, I mean, there's all different types of food. So you've got all the different cultures. Um, you know, there's obviously Japanese food, yeah. Chinese food, Indian food, like all just amazing Spanish, like all different cuisines. And, oh, it was, it was incredible. You yeah. know, so there's nothing like it in the world. Um, Sounds like then, a foodie's dream. Oh, it was absolutely <laughs> fun. Um and then, you know, the gym areas and like all the different areas they have there set up for the athletes. I remember in um, in Sydney, they had like this big sort of common area for the Australian athletes and every night, like an Australian icon singer would come in and oh. sing for us. Um, and they have concerts in there and, oh, it was just so cool. I mean, I don't imagine, I think Tokyo is going to be very different for yeah. the athletes and I think that's sort of sad that they're not going to be able to experience that. But, you know, in past Olympics we've had um, just all sorts of people that, you know, high-profile people come through the village and um, just celebrate with us and really, um, I guess, get to experience the excitement and um, everything from the athletes in the village. So, you know, obviously security is super strict, um, uh, so it does take a little bit of time getting in and getting out. You can't go anywhere without your pass, yada, yada, yada. But it's, yeah, pretty, it's out of this world experience for sure. It sounds like you kind of develop a real community within the Olympic Village. So It is a real community and particularly because you have sort of one or two, normally you just sort of have one or two buildings that is just Australian only and then so you really get to know the athletes and you've got elevators that go up between floors, um, so different oh, teams, cool. different sports. Um, so you do tend to mingle, um, you know, physio areas. Are, it's sort of like being at the AIS yeah. but, you know, in a different country and all like right there within your little sphere so yeah. it's it is pretty cool it yeah. sounds it sounds really cool um so just kind of in saying that now obviously that sounds like it was a huge part of the experience of the olympics and, and being an olympian and now tokyo will be very different given the covid situation no crowds and health protocols uh what impact do you think that this might have on the athletes in tokyo Oh, look, I've been following um, some of the athletes on social media just to sort of see what, you know, what they're experiencing. And in terms of the athletes village, it doesn't look too different other than dining hall has those separators, like the dividers, yeah. the perspective dividers between each one, which is kind of weird to see. But, you know, they've got to, I guess, do what they have to do to make sure that this virus doesn't um, take over in the village. And it, it will be a different experience for them, but... Um, I think it's still going to be amazing and so special for, for all the athletes. It looks like the community is set up, you know, um, their area within the village is, it's all decked out in Australian gear. They've got, you know, um, a breakfast bar, they've got cafes, they've got everything they need to make yeah. sure that, you know, they're happy and, and well looked after. No, absolutely. And I think kind of, as you said before, um, with your first Olympics, you had people taking care of you without you even really knowing it. So I'm sure I have absolutely no doubt that that's the culture around the Opals and the Australian squad in general. So everyone will be having each other's back in there and it'll be creating a real family atmosphere within the Olympic bubble or whatever whatever that may look like. The, um, sure. Yeah, sure. yeah. Um, so comparatively, what impact did it have to have friends, families and, and fans actually at your games? Um, look, you've got your friends and your teammates, you know, so I, I feel like, you know, if you're close with your teammates, you sort of, 
they're like family anyway, yeah. um, I suppose. Uh, you know, mum and dad came in really handy for me, um, particularly as I got older. So I think 2008, they were over in, in China with us. And, you know, I really needed them at that point. It's been pretty well documented that I was having um, a few mental health struggles at Olympics. And to have my parents there was, you know, to be able to go after a game and go and eat with them and just be able to talk and open yeah. up and, and have them as that support system was is was huge for me there's no doubt but um you know my teammates and Tully Bevelacqua who was one of my best friends she was with me I and at playing um you know and I really relied heavily on Marion Stewart our um, team manager and the people within the team as well to sort of take care of me and they really did um and that's what I guess that's what being in a team is about um yeah so, yeah, no, it's important, but it's not sort of everything because you do have that support system in your, in your athletes and, and the team members. Yeah, that, that absolutely is, is vital. And I think it'll be a huge contribution in, in their success as well throughout the Olympics. So kind of in saying that, the Opals got a win over Team USA. What, what are your expectations for the Opals in Tokyo? Oh, man, I mean, they... They blew everyone away, yeah. I think. You know, watching that game, they were just incredible when they played USA in Las Vegas. So that was so special to watch. Um, I think they're just going to get better. You know, I think they've got a great style of basketball. They're running. They're playing super aggressive defense. Um, everybody is playing their role. Like every single athlete out there, there's no like mega superstars on the team but every single athlete is stepping up and playing their role to the very best of their ability and I think you know coming Olympics that's what you want is that everybody is reaching their peak um, at the same time and they're reaching it together yeah and I guess one thing that I saw in that game was that they are playing um, a style of basketball together like they're there for each other and it's just it was so great to watch you know there was no there, there was no fighting with the referees. There was no just they just got the job done, and that's the sort of basketball that I love watching. And you know what? It's Opal's basketball. That's how it's been. You know, we from we've been a part of this culture that is resilient, that um, definitely bats above, but bats above its weight. Is that even a saying? Yeah, yeah you know what I'm saying. Above average, something like that. <laughs> Well, we're, we're, you know, we're um, always the underdogs and yeah. we keep fighting. And I think that's something that um, the girls definitely showed and it was just sort of like watching, um, you know, the Opals of old. It was really incredible. Yeah, I think, I agree. I think as, as the games go on, they're just going to get better and better and they're going to get more exciting to watch and, you know, probably get to a point where it's like, can it get better than this? And they're going to get better again. So, uh, yeah. so much to look forward to for the Australian Opals and the Olympics in general. So thank you so much again, Lauren. Uh, your knowledge yeah. on yeah. basketball and, and the Olympics, of course, is unmatched. So what an honour <laughs> to be able to speak with you today and thanks for being on Women With Drive. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Women With Drive, hosted by Lou Brown. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could, leave us a review.